Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming early today due to Ramadan. Uh, we are uh, we have this uh, conference in the um, early afternoon, and today we have the great pleasure to uh, welcome Matthew Douglas Adams, uh, who is senior research scholar at uh, New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. Uh, he holds a dual PhD in anthropology and Egyptology from the University of Pennsylvania. And as you all know, he has directed field work at Abydos for more than 30 years. Uh, his most recent excavations have focused on the economic underpinnings of early royal activity at the site, including the rediscovery of the Abydos Royal Brewery. He led his first excavation in uh, Atabaidos in 1991, sorry to say, <laughs> and since then he has directed excavations at many different areas of the site, from the pre-dynastic to the late antique, and from the Abydos stone site, that was the subject of his PhD dissertation, to the monumental cult and crossers of Egypt's first kings, and as associate director and field director of the expedition from 1999 to uh, 2017, in collaboration with uh, Professor David O'Connor, he led a range of initiatives that have redefined our understanding of the importance of Abydos in Egypt's early history, the emergence of uh, Egyptian kinship, and the transformation of the site into a religious center of national importance. And he has led also a very important uh, architectural, architectural conservation program at the second dynasty cult enclosure of King Raser Emoui, known today as the Shunet El Zebib, and is the, exactly the topic of uh, his talk uh, today. And we are very pleased to welcome you, and the floor is yours. <laughs> So, the, the short life and many afterlives of the Shunta Zabib at Abydos. Uh, you would never know it visiting the site today. You, um, you go to the northern part uh, of the site, a little bit off the normal uh, tourist uh, itinerary, and the desert landscape uh, is completely dominated visually by this uh, rather unassuming mud brick uh, structure. Large, but other than that, not so uh, impressive. Uh, but its modern day appearance belies its uh, uh, terrific importance uh, in Egypt's cultural heritage and early uh, history. And uh, I would argue, or I have argued, uh, that it was an important piece of the puzzle in what led to uh, this part of the site uh, being designated as sacred space uh, in ancient times subsequent to the early dynastic period. Uh, the Shuna has been uh, noted by uh, many scholars, generations of scholars who have come to the site uh, it appears on the map of Abydos in the Description de l'Egypte and, of course, here on Mariette's uh, map from the middle of the 19th century. Uh, Mariette was the first to excavate there. He was uh, on a mission to find the tomb of Osiris, which he knew from classical sources was at Abydos. Uh, and he thought, well, perhaps this giant thing out there in the desert, maybe that's it. Uh, and he undertook a very large scale excavations in the interior, uh, but came away with no result. There it is. There's his plan, uh, rather carefully done. Uh, some subtle features, which uh, we'll come back to uh, a bit later uh, in the talk. And some 
19th century, end of the 19th century, uh, engravings from photographs. Uh, both these, I think, published by Moss Barrow. Uh, the appearance today hasn't changed all that much uh, from what we saw in the more than a century ago. This massively built uh, mud brick rectangular enclosure, uh, it, it can be identified as belonging to King Khasakemwi uh, by large numbers of seal impressions that have been found in it and around it, one of which you see there. And Khasakemwi uh, is perhaps best known at the site from his tomb at Umm el Gab, uh, the last royal tomb in the early royal necropolis, uh, what I might uh, call or characterize as Egypt's first Valley of the Kings, the original Valley of the Kings. But we now know that uh, all the uh, royal tombs of Dynasty I and both royal tombs of Dynasty II, Perebsen and Khazakemwi, uh, were accompanied by monumental cult places uh, that you uh, can see on the lower right, the plan of the, the, uh, the known monuments uh, up till now. Still missing the last couple from the end of the First Dynasty, but they're almost certainly there. Uh, so each king at this time had a two-part funerary complex his tomb itself, which was located about one and a half kilometers out into the desert in a rather remote uh, location, uh, and then the very large monumental cult place, which was immediately adjacent to the ancient town. I would argue that these were the visible monumental components of the royal funerary complex. Uh, it's very difficult to discern, well, impossible really to discern now, uh, but Khasakemwi's monument is just one of this very large series, uh, the remains of which are buried uh, all around it. So it was just one iteration of an architectural tradition that was repeated again and again and again uh, in this part of the site. Uh, it was the largest of the known ancient monuments here. Uh, it consisted of a main or inner uh, enclosure, which you see on the left there, uh, characterized by an exterior niched facade, uh, originally uh, brilliantly painted white. Uh, five meters thick uh, are the walls at the base and ab around 11 meters or so high as well as a secondary outer enclosure which enclosed the main enclosure, uh, rendering it even more uh, a kind of separated uh, space from the world, the everyday world outside. Uh, we know from uh, traces of red paint that we have found dripped here and there uh, that somewhere on the upper part of the exterior of the main wall was red painted decoration, which we also see in the, um, the enclosure of King Perebsen next door. But uh, nowhere uh, is the original plaster preserved high enough for us to tell what this decoration was exactly. In Perebsen, it's a simple red horizontal stripe. Uh, the monument had uh, elaborate gateways uh, the, uh, the biggest of which was at the north corner, which you see here with a small uh, forecourt, uh, an interior gateway chamber, and a change of access uh, required to enter the interior space of the monument, which was uh, uh, around one hectare, two, two acres uh, in area. Uh, and the wall defined uh, this space that was separated from the outside world uh, and in which some kind of ritual, rituals were uh, conducted on behalf of the king. Uh, our excavations have revealed quite a lot 
of uh, what remains of the original Dynasty II uh, interior. Uh, at least one person in the audience was there uh, when this photograph was taken, uh, 21 years ago now, in 2001. Uh, this is part of the original uh, Second Dynasty interior surface. Uh, the, the large uh, features that you see here are mahmaras, they're, they're mixing basins for uh, plaster. The one on the right was for the white plaster that was used to finish the walls, the one on the left was for the mud uh, muna uh, that was used to coat the brick masonry before the application of the white layer. Just a close up uh, of those and they were breaking up unused bricks, unused brick fragments uh, in the manufacture of the muna. In the interior, there's only one structure uh, that survives, uh, built in brick, this small chapel in the southern part uh, of the monument. All of the other known royal enclosures have the same, a small interior brick chapel, always in the southern uh, part. However, our excavations have revealed that in all of that other space, there were originally other kinds of structures uh, present, but built into organic materials. We found them uh, in the, uh, one of the enclosures of King Aha, dismantled uh, and left in place on the floor. And inside this uh, structure, uh, we found very large wooden timbers uh, from a dismantled structure buried in a pit, but in very poor condition. As I mentioned, the, uh, uh, the interior was used for the performance of ritual, uh, and the nature of that ritual uh, we can now discuss with some confidence because we have the material products of its performance that were carried out the southern gateway from the area of the interior cult building and dumped over this very large area of the exterior. Uh, this is our excavation here uh, in 2012, and nearly the entirety of the excavated area uh, was covered in a very thick deposit of beer jars. Uh, in some places, this deposit is more than one meter thick and nearly exclusively this form. All empty, all unstoppered. This is an analogous to another very, very large uh, deposit of the same type of vessel associated with the uh, cultic enclosure of King Perubsen, the corner of which you see just here. So it appears that Beer was being brought to the enclosure, stoppers taken off, and the beer vessels were being emptied, and then the empties were discarded uh, outside uh, the gateway. Well, this is very reminiscent of uh, the pouring of liquid offerings in every period of, uh, of uh, ancient Egyptian history, probably the single most well-known aspect of Egyptian ritual religious ritual, I should say. Um, and I would argue that, uh, that uh, uh, the performance of this ritual was focused on the king himself in his divine uh, aspect. We know that this belonged to King Kasekemwe. The, the, uh, uh, the seal impressions, seal impressions are also found in amongst the uh, big deposits of beer jars. Uh, as well as charcoal, bits of incense, and deposits of, multiple deposits of bucrania, bovine skulls. And these two appear in later periods very, very frequently in offering scenes. You can think of all of those funerary stele with the offering table and the piles of stuff, and almost always there's one of these guys uh, stuck in there.
So the range of material that's present, uh, uh, I would suggest, all supports the interpretation of the performance of offering ritual uh, for the king inside uh, the enclosure. So this was uh, a structure in which the royal cult was performed, uh, and apparently during the reign of the king. They're frequently called funerary enclosures because they do uh, pair with the royal tomb at Umul Gab. However, uh, the, the evidence suggests that they were uh, not just uh, a one-off, they were not just used during the funeral ceremonies of the king, but rather were used for some time, perhaps 10 or 20 years. There's a, uh, we observe use wear uh, on the architecture. Uh, and I would argue that it's during the reign of the king. Now, uh, uh, an important question uh, that arises with respect to these early royal cult places, why is Chasek Emwes the only one that's still there? If every early king of Egypt with a tomb at Um el Gab uh, built one of these, why are they all erased, essentially, from the landscape? Here you see the excavated remains of one of the earliest. This one belonged to King Aha at the beginning of uh, Dynasty I. Just an indication of uh, what was once there. Um, Aha actually had four uh, enclosures. The uh, the template wasn't quite uh, worked out, either for the enclosures of the royal tomb uh, in his uh, reign, but very immediately afterward became standardized. His successor, Jur, just has one enclosure. We have uh, found very clear evidence that the enclosures of Aha, as well as those of all the other early kings, uh, in this part of the site were deliberately demolished uh, at the end of the reign of the king for whom they were built. So they stood 10 or 20 years during the reign of the king and then the, the enclosures themselves, like the subsidiary graves uh, that existed around them, the people that were buried in those graves who were to accompany the king into the next world, I would argue that the function of this monument itself underwent a kind of ritual burial uh, to be available to the king uh, in the next world. In that case, oh, it had, there it is its little chapel inside. Just to show you, it conforms to the template. Why is Chasek Emwes still standing? Well, the tomb of, <coughs> the tomb of Chasek Emwe uh, began as a, as a rather modest affair, just this central portion uh, was the original uh, tomb, very much like that of uh, his predecessor, Per of Sen, uh, nearby at Umal Gab. But the tomb was expanded in several stages, uh, becoming ever grander, ever larger. Uh, and we see a similar kind of pattern, I would suggest, uh, occurring at the Shuna. First of all, uh, the main uh, enclosure itself is much more massively built than any of the preceding early royal monuments. Uh, and for that reason, I would suggest that, uh, that it was intended from the beginning to stand. It was the first of these royal monuments that was built with the underlying idea that it would stand for eternity. And this idea we see uh, in stone and writ large in the very next reign uh, of his successor, Netrachet Djoser. But I would argue that it actually originates here in this monument. In addition to the uh, main uh, enclosure itself, uh, we have the secondary outer enclosure 
which itself is more massive than any other early royal monument at Abydos. So Chazak Emwi, as with his tomb, bigger and grander and bigger and grander, the same sort of thing is uh, happening uh, at the enclosure. He saw himself as expressing kingship on a different level uh, than his predecessors had done. After Chasek Emwi's death and burial, this entire area of the site, filled with these buried uh, royal monuments, had no intrusions of any kind for around 700 years. Uh, I would argue that this was uh, a deliberate state policy, we know from later periods, that uh, Egyptian kings took a direct interest in the use of landscape uh, at Abydos. And I would argue that uh, the, the desert, the low desert uh, landscape here, uh, inhabited by Chasek and the buried remains of the other early royal monuments, as well as the royal tombs uh, in the distance, that this was exclusively royal space and was to be avoided. It was protected. Uh, the uh, uh, old cemeteries in the Old Kingdom that served the local community were established at the very northern margin of this part of the site. In the early Old Kingdom and in the later Old Kingdom, they uh, occur on the other side of the uh, sacred or processional wadi that you see uh, just here in what we now call uh, the middle cemetery, but nothing came into this uh, early royal space itself until, as I said, the uh, first intermediate period, the first burials uh, we begin to see are in Dynasty uh, 11. But once that happened, it's as though the monument of Chasekemwi became a kind of magnet uh, for human burial. The burials cluster along the walls on all sides. Uh, these are just indications of Middle Kingdom uh, burials. Uh, many of them uh, very well preserved. The exterior uh, environs of the monument were of not much interest to the early excavators. So uh, a lot of the burials are completely intact uh, uh, undisturbed uh, since ancient times, including, and many of them uh, had uh, lovely hair treatment uh, still preserved, as you can see here. In a couple of cases, uh, we had uh, kind of micro-environmental miracles. Uh, in this case, this is a, a burial of uh, the Middle Kingdom, and that it looks like cloth covering uh, the individual. In fact, it's a sand crust. At some point, moisture seeped through, uh, maybe a single rain event or so, seeped slowly through the big sand dune that this burial was made in, penetrated the coffin, penetrated uh, the body, and the sand that adhered to the shroud placed over the body was uh, cemented in place. The cloth is gone, but the sand remains. Even uh, the folds and wrinkles and the shape of the toes, so you can see uh, just there. Uh, another uh, Middle Kingdom burial uh, just nearby also was partly preserved as the sand, with the sand crust, but the most interesting aspect is uh, the, uh, this was a young woman, uh, late adolescence, provided with a fine set of uh, grave goods, including these hippo ivory uh, clappers, a scarab that uh, gives a definite dating in the 13th dynasty, uh, and she was provided with a lovely uh, beaded diadem over very 
nice hair extensions that had been woven carefully into her natural hair. Uh, this is, uh, so the, we were talking about the southern side of the monument there. This is around the corner by the southeast corner gateway here. Every pit that you see cut in the ancient floor here is for burial. Uh, this pattern continued right around uh, nearly the whole perimeter uh, of the monument, more burials of the Middle Kingdom, usually tucked right up against the wall in wooden uh, rectangular coffins. Uh, in some cases, it's clear that they had been pillaged anciently, but the, uh, the robbers knew exactly what they were looking for and which end of the coffin was which. They were looking for things like this, at the head and neck end, and it's always the head and neck end where the sideboards have been penetrated. Someone reached in there and jumbled around and pulled out uh, things like this. And this is a, uh, by the way, a silver uh, pendant. Uh, <clears throat> the adult burials were usually just against the wall, but we had a considerable number of children were usually in much smaller coffins actually cut, uh, set into pits cut into uh, the base of the wall, which you see here, a small wooden coffin, uh, still with its rope sling uh, intact, uh, which was used to carry uh, the coffin to the site at the time of burial. Uh, there's the child uh, inside. And the, the preservation, especially of the children, was uh, remarkable. This individual still has its eyebrows and eyelashes. So in the Middle Kingdom, when all the rest of the uh, desert landscape around the Shuna was being used as a cemetery and came to be filled with thousands of uh, tombs and offering chapels and surface interments as those we've seen clustered at the monument. Nothing intruded upon the inside. They still left the interior uh, alone for roughly another millennium. So at the very end of the New Kingdom, beginning of the Third Intermediate Period, is the first time we see ancient activity post-Second Dynasty inside uh, the monument. And uh, uh, a large dune that accumulated uh, in the southwest interior corner illustrates this uh, activity very, very well. This dune was completely filled from top to bottom with pottery vessels like these. Uh, those on the outermost part of the dune uh, were later uh, into Ptolemaic times. Those buried more deeply in the interior were at the earlier end of the sequence, early third intermediate period or so. Uh, <clears throat> and all of these contain animal burials. Uh, here is uh, Salima Ikram uh, removing one of the animals buried in one of these jars. Uh, a dog, very nicely uh, preserved. Uh, there were a large number of dog burials at the earlier end of the, uh, the, the sequence, uh, but the large majority uh, were of ibises. They occurred in ceramic vessels, such as this one. Uh, they also occurred in deposits like this, which was essentially a, a giant, a mass grave of ibises covered with matting and they occurred in uh, large pits absolutely packed uh, with ceramic vessels, each vessel containing a single uh, ibis body. In one instance, mostly this is completely, these are completely without inscriptions, uh, in one instance we found a small mud brick chapel that had been built uh, along with the deposit of burial jars. Inside uh, was a stela, unfortunately a bit difficult to uh, make out, uh, but the wonders of D-stretch help us a bit. 
So we have a female figure here holding a sistrum, a smaller male, maybe a priest, uh, standing before uh, Osiris. So it, it uh, emphasizes the connection uh, between the ibis cult, the animal cults that are being uh, practiced, and the, the bigger uh, cult of Osiris that uh, uh, characterized the site. In addition to the animal cults, uh, we also see other kinds of deposits. Uh, this is a set of magical beeswax figures, uh, most of which had been broken from their bases, uh, clearly in a ritual act uh, arranged very carefully, in the, uh, as you see uh, here. So this is a, a kind of single moment uh, in the ancient uh, ritual use of uh, the monument. Some individual came here and did a spell uh, in which these figurines uh, were part. In addition, we also have uh, a large deposit of discarded ritual equipment. Cartonage broad collar, uh, very nicely uh, painted, including with a representation of a pendant here. Uh, and this is very well known uh, from objects such as this, which don't survive, but uh, it's clear that our piece uh, had been torn from uh, the front of some kind of bark like this. Uh, it couldn't be discarded uh, in a mundane way, so all of this material was discarded in a sacred uh, context. We also have these applique, applique Jed and Kiet, uh, amulets or uh, uh, elements from probably a, a box or a shrine uh, of some kind. We only have the appliques, not the original surface on which they were uh, attached. These are, this motif is very well known. You see it on the, uh, the outer shrine uh, of the tomb, from the tomb of Tutankhamun. You see it on uh, uh, one of the chests uh, from his tomb as well, going around uh, underneath uh, as a decorative uh, panel. So this interior, this cultic activity inside the monument continued up into Ptolemaic times, uh, but for, for part of uh, the first millennium BC, another area outside the monument was also the focus of uh, ritual activity of various kinds. And that is the southeast exterior corner. Mariette first noted this in his excavations. He said, we found a lot of stele here, uh, 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 which frequently referenced Osiris, Lord of Births, uh, uh, and were usually a uh, female figure like a chantress or a priestess. Uh, this has been the subject of considerable discussion. Uh, and we have a bit of additional new information to add to that. Today, uh, uh, Mariette's excavations had uh, pretty much cleaned out uh, the ancient uh, contents of this southern corridor. And this is where he found all these stele. Uh, we find them still in his spoil heap outside. So here we are, we're just outside the corner and this is uh, the, the top of a very large spoil heap left from Mariette's work and quite a number of uh, steely very similar to those that he discusses uh, were found here. Uh, in both cases you can see uh, figures of Osiris uh, on the left here, the, the inscriptions are unfortunately uh, very, very faint. Uh, one piece of particular interest, whoops, where are we? One piece of particular interest uh, is this one, uh, which you may, on which you may be able to make out 
a seated goddess with a snake's head and the double plume headdress. Here's a closer view. And although they're very faint, you may just be able to make out Weret Hakao, uh, the great one of magic. Uh, and as far as I know, this is the only attestation of this deity from this part of the site. We found many, many, many uh, uh, offering basins, usually with two uh, chambers and coated on the inside with some really foul smelling organic uh, material. In one case, here on this uh, example, there are two representations of frogs. So it seems that um, this may have had to do with the idea of rebirth, the frogs emerging from uh, the mud of the uh, alluviation, the, the, the kind of uh, replication of the moment of creation. The most elaborate example uh, that we uh, have combines the offering basin form with a proper offering table. It has this incredible decoration on the outside. Uh, I've not seen anything quite like this anywhere and I would love to know if anyone has. But it's clear that uh, this particular location at Ashuna was an area where stelae are being erected, where uh, uh, offerings are being made of some kind um, and in addition, we have a large number of burials of infants, neonates. Mariette mentions these also. Uh, here are just a couple of examples of the coffins. Unfortunately, because of Mariette's uh, rather rough and ready work, we don't find, we haven't found any of these still in its original uh, context, but just rather out in his spoil heap. And this is the lid uh, of one of these with what appears to be a snake's head, but with arms enveloping, protecting, I, I would imagine, the, uh, the individual inside the coffin. So this, uh, these various kinds of uh, ritual activity uh, carry us through into Ptolemaic times. But then again, for many centuries after the Ptolemaic period, the Shuna is just sitting there. So this is kind of a second interlude where the monument is not being violated. It's not being intruded upon. Nothing seems to be happening, while at the very same time, Loads of, of uh, tombs are being built around it uh, uh, continuously. Eventually, though, in about the fifth or sixth century, uh, the monument was used again, but this way, this, and this was also a sacred reuse, uh, but of a very different character. You might note these large uh, voids that are present in the wall here. Mariette notes them uh, on his plan. Here's a better view. And the presence of these voids uh, was part of what brought us, uh, the project, uh, toward undertaking a large-scale uh, architectural preservation program here. Every single one of these voids threatened this entire area adjacent to it uh, with catastrophic collapse. And if uh, combined with a number of other uh, condition problems, if, we didn't, if someone didn't make interventions, uh, large parts of the original fabric of the monument uh, would be lost. But uh, we, we had the challenge that these are important archaeological features. 
Here's a closer view of one of them. And excavation revealed that these are the remains of monastic spaces from late antiquity. In fact, the whole monument was occupied by an early Christian monastic community. It just so happens that uh, some of the spaces that they lived in were actually dug into the fabric of the original walls. I can't imagine that they slept that easily at night with those tons of masonry hanging over their heads, but we didn't find anyone in his horsehair shirt crushed under a fall of brickwork. They seemed to have cleaned the place out fairly well when they left. Uh, this actually is one of the two very well-preserved examples of what a complete uh, suite of rooms uh, was like at the monument. All of those spaces built into the wall originally had this inner white plastered room or oratory, prayer space, usually with a small utilitarian uh, space next door and then one or more uh, exterior spaces here that included a kitchen, uh, storage rooms, and, and so on. Uh, here's the interior. Uh, this one, the oratory, has a niche in the east wall, a prayer niche, uh, and also a mud bed with a plastered brick pillow. You can't imagine it was too comfortable, but comfort wasn't the idea. So the, the niche that you see on the left uh, gives us 100% certainty about the nature of the occupation. The Coptic inscription uh, refers specifically to uh, the Holy Trinity and Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is one of the uh, kitchen uh, features that is very well preserved, uh, a double chambered cooktop. Uh, it would still work very well if we decided to fire it up, I think. Um, <clears throat> But as I said, these monastic spaces, particularly when they were dug into the fabric of the original wall, created tremendous structural instabilities. And these had to be addressed if the monument was to survive. So the, uh, uh, this uh, effort was uh, uh, supported in large part by grants from the American Research Center in Egypt. Uh, and consisted primarily of the infilling of these spaces with new mud brick masonry. The bricks were uh, made uh, to the specifications and dimensions of the originals. And then these voids, after excavation and careful documentation, were then gradually filled in a uh, separation layer was always put in place to prevent the new masonry infill from touching any preserved original uh, surfaces or features. And the new brickwork was then uh, uh, laid so as to meet the original uh, coursing uh, in the adjacent walls. Uh, these uh, voids uh, were filled in in such a way that the, the new masonry would create a, a kind of shadow in the wall so that uh, the presence of this important cultural feature uh, would be indicated, uh, but at the same time, the original fabric of the wall around it would be stabilized uh, and is no longer in danger of catastrophic collapse. Uh, other parts of the monument uh, were also in a terrible uh, state. Uh, this section of the east wall of the main enclosure completely undermined. Uh, in some areas, such as this large void here, the five meters thickness of original masonry had been reduced to about 75 centimeters at the base of the wall. The whole thing was ready to 
come over, and I'm afraid that we have to thank uh, our uh, esteemed uh, uh, forebear, Mariette, uh, for this. His uh, workforce excavated a gigantic pit uh, in the eastern half of the interior because he was looking for the tomb of Osiris. Uh, he just found sand. Uh, but the pit came right to the edge of this wall, and it was not backfilled. So after he left the Shuna, gradually the bricks from the bottom of the wall began to tumble down into the pit, and uh, this led to an ever-increasing uh, cascade uh, effect so that after 150 years, this is the result. And so this now has been stabilized, and this is the current uh, condition. And uh, this wall is not going anywhere. Uh, in fact, hopefully will last another 5,000 years. Um, one other uh, major type of feature that we uh, had to address in our conservation work is the original gateways. Uh, this is the collapsed area of the gate, a gateway in the western uh, main enclosure wall. And just here is what's left of an opening in the outer or secondary enclosure uh, that's in alignment with this entrance. The original gateways were roofed in wood. So eventually the wood would have been robbed out or insect eaten. The bricks above begun to collapse. Uh, and it, it didn't help that uh, there were monastic cells here and here on both sides uh, of the gateway. So when those collapsed, this entire area was uh, completely lost, resulting in this gigantic gap uh, in the wall. In addition, large structural cracks developed behind uh, on both sides behind this vertical uh, wall end that were in danger of calving off uh, another catastrophic loss would have been the result. So our solution here was to fill this area in uh, to prevent that from happening, but how do we do that while also acknowledging the presence of one of the original gateways. Well, uh, careful excavation and documentation of the uh, area uh, allowed us to work out the original dimensions uh, of the gateway, and we started to recreate the original opening that was roofed instead of with wood, but rather with reinforced concrete uh, elements in the shape of wooden poles. And uh, you might, uh, we took inspiration from this, uh, for this from the pole roof that's represented in the enclosure of Netraket Djoser at uh, Saqqara, which was the very next royal monument built after this one, the succeeding reign. And here's the finished product. So the reconstructed part is just the gateway itself and its immediately immediate uh, uh, adjacent area. And with distance from that, it goes back into the rough blended uh, uh, texture that uh, evokes the eroded uh, fabric of the original wall. This conservation effort is not complete. Uh, we've, we've got about 70% um, of the needed conservation work uh, done, but uh, this is still an ongoing uh, process. Uh, the idea is in support of the ministry's policy of integrating the Shuna and other uh, more remote components of the site of Abydos into visitor itineraries. So the monument needs to be stable, both for its own preservation, but also to make it suitable for visitors. 
uh, and it represents a very important part of the story of the site. Uh, so it should provide a significant enhancement to visitor experience. So uh, this is a, uh, an overview of the long durée uh, of this one monument, uh, a kind of microcosm of kind of microcosm of uh, the, uh, the history of Abydos uh, generally. Uh, but as it stands, it's a sentinel, I would argue, a sentinel remaining. It marks the site as the place that was used by Egypt's first kings. And I believe that the, uh, the avoidance of the entire area where the Shuna is for seven centuries after Hasek Emwi, and then the avoidance of the interior for another thousand years after that, says that the ancient people viewed this place as something very, very special. Uh, and when it was used again, it was only used for ritual religious purposes. They weren't building houses inside. Uh, so I would argue that it's very likely that, that the presence of this monument as a kind of survivor from the beginnings of Egyptian history uh, may have been what for the ancient people marked this place, this site, as being sacred space. And the area had a special name, Egyptologists know it very well, uh, Terrace of the Great God. Uh, and I've argued that this entire part of the desert landscape is the Terrace of the Great God and that it's marked by the presence of this monument, which appears to us very much as it would have appeared to throughout almost all of its history. Middle Kingdom Egyptians would not have seen gleaming white geometric monument of King Hasek Emwe. They would have seen this. Maybe a few more bits of wall standing, but more or less like that. So in, in preserving the monument as it is, we're preserving uh, uh, a reference to the tremendous sacredness that was uh, in ancient Egyptian times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed for this uh, fascinating lecture. Uh, of course, we, we learned a lot, and also we, we have also to, to congratulate you for this fantastic work of restoration. I had the opportunity to visit Trinette Zabib three months ago, oh. and it was quite an experience, and I, I could realize how excellent was the, the restoration and uh, how many bricks you had to... <laughs> because we, we have the same problem at Karnak, you know, we are restoring also but brick walls, and, uh, but they are much smaller, and, uh, and your work is, uh, of course, uh, very impressive. We have time for questions. Hey, hey, Matt. Hi, Michelle. Okay, so do you think it was, it fell upon the successor to demolish the enclosure, and perhaps that's why it wasn't demolished, because Djoser just went away? Well, he didn't go away. He well, just went elsewhere. He went elsewhere. Yeah. The, uh, I should, this is Dr. Michelle Marler, uh, who was actually in several of the photos of the early dynastic work, um, and who now is working at uh, Mitrahina. Uh, so the uh, longtime Abydos veteran. Uh, this is an important question. Uh, yes, I would say that uh, it, it seems very likely that the successor king demolished the monument of his predecessor um, because he was going to then build his own enclosure. Uh, but the, uh, the, dip, the changes that we observe 
uh, between the first and second dynasty. We, we begin to see some of these changes already in Parapsen's monument, changes in design and architectural emphasis. Uh, the important gateway goes from the southeast to the north. Uh, there's, there's no, there are no more subsidiary graves, um, a few other things. So, uh, and I think that this is influenced by the intervening years when royal tombs were at Saqqara in the earlier part of Dynasty II. So the idea of what the royal cult place was, was changing. Uh, if Khasak Emwe's monument uh, were like uh, all the others in, in scale, uh, uh, I would say it was probably likely that, oh, they, his, his uh, successor couldn't be bothered. His emphasis was in Saqqara. He was already working on the Great Step Pyramid Complex. Uh, but given the very important areas of difference with this monument versus everything that came before, I think this was a deliberate decision on the part of Cossack Emwe to uh, to deploy a kind of um, different idea of royal cult place. It's so much more massive. I mean, like four times as massive than anything built previously. Um, I cannot, it, it, it's hard to imagine uh, them ever having a, a, the intention to demolish that. Um, and, uh, and given what we see uh, with his successor, I think that Djoser, who was probably his son, uh, is, is taking the idea first uh, used by his father of building for eternity, um, which we don't <laughs> see before in any of these royal monuments, uh, and, and running with it. So he's building it in stone, which really makes it for eternity, and he's building it, you know, on a much larger uh, scale. But the, the I think the, the fundamental idea is is being used here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I wonder only if the the uh, earlier. Uh, these patriarchs, uh, these uh, structures are deliberately destroyed. Where would all the brick go? It's I tremendous think, amounts of. Uh, well, we, we do have uh, we do have quite a bit of uh, of brick debris uh, remaining around the bases, the excavated bases of the walls. Um, I I didn't mention uh, that in many cases it appears that. Uh, the, the monuments were very carefully prepared for this demolition. They were cleaned inside and out. The floors were covered with sterile deposit of sand, and then the walls are brought down, and this brick debris uh, that was uh, uh, at the base of the wall on the sand is still there. Mm -hmm. I think a large part of it was probably taken away and reused in the construction of the next Monument. I can't imagine it would have been wasted. Yeah, I, I can't imagine either. The Egyptians were and very practical about these things. Yeah, and please another question. Are there any stamped bricks? Any evidence? No? And why do you think they would destroy such structures? Well, uh, uh, it seems very un-Egyptian, right? You know, we think of the Egyptians uh, in, in every period as building these gigantic royal monuments that were to stand forever. Uh, and in this, we see this in the step pyramid, in the pyramids of the old kingdom, and then in the new kingdom with the gigantic temples. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, but the archeological evidence itself suggests, and we see this repeated the same pattern again and again and again uh, in all of the royal monuments up till this one. Uh, so we have to account for the evidence that we're presented. 
all the monuments of Dynasty I are surrounded by the graves of uh, courtiers and retainers, uh, both the royal enclosure and the royal tomb. The idea being that uh, these individuals are buried to accompany the king into the next world. He's going uh, by virtue of burial in his tomb, uh, and they can go with him uh, in the same, through the same mechanism. Uh, I wonder, given the ritual preparation that we observe in these monuments, if the, if the cult enclosures were seen as undergoing a kind of ritual burial it, themselves, that the monument itself is being buried, like the retainers around it, to make the transition from this world to the next. And for the monument and its functions, its ritual functions, to be available to the king uh, in the next world. Uh, of course, there are no, they don't tell us. There are no inscriptions to give an explanation. But I think given the overall pattern that we see, it seems a likely explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question actually follows the previous ones. So, because none of them seems to overlap each other, do you think that there were still some markers that allowed not to build a new Shuna on an ancient Shuna? Because the first kings were dead for decades when, uh, like, Ezekiel we became king. So, do you think that they kept a trace of the ancient Shuna to always build next to the other? And the second question is, in the Middle Kingdom, so you think they saw probably what we see today, which means none of the other Shunas were visible, they were that, completely buried? That's right. Okay. So, so the first question. Uh, I think I th whether traces were visible on the surface or not, I can't say. Uh, however, we can say that the later generations, the later generations knew exactly where every feature of the preceding monuments was. Uh, for example, in the construction of the enclosure of King Parabsen, second dynasty, when the royal tomb has been in Saqqara for several generations, so maybe it's 100 years later, they come back and Parabsen is going to build an enclosure. The east wall of the enclosure of Parabsen follows exactly the line, the west line, of the subsidiary graves of Jur. It's, it's even a little askew to follow this. Now, there is zero evidence that these subsidiary graves around the enclosures were marked on the surface in any way. In fact, there's evidence to suggest to the contrary, that they were hidden, buried features. Um, <clears throat> So somewhere in some government office, there was a bureaucrat with a papyrus in which, on which there was a map of this royal space. And uh, so that later officials could refer to this and know exactly where they were. Thank you very much. The talk was fascinating. Uh, I just have a very small detailed question sure. about the beer jars. Um, did you conduct any uh, sort of uh, wear analysis or traceological somehow to determine that it was in fact beer inside or is it just the general uh, denomination for the type that you're using? Uh, uh, well, uh, we know from uh, Egyptian iconography uh, that this type of vessel was uh, used for to contain beer. We see it in uh, beer making reliefs of the Old Kingdom and, and later. Uh, uh, it just so happens, I didn't have time to touch on it today, but it just so happens that uh, the last couple of years uh, we've been focused on the excavation of uh, 
oh. a gigantic brewery right. uh, only about 200 meters north of the Shuna uh, that dates to the transition between, roughly, between uh, the pre late pre-dynastic and the early dynastic period. Um, and the, uh, the production capacity of that brewery, uh, we estimate, as of now, uh, at about 50,000 liters per batch, which is enough beer to give a pint to every single person in a 100,000 seat sports arena. It's an unbelievable level of production for ancient times. Um, <clears throat> the biggest ancient brewery anywhere in the world, not just Egypt. Uh, and it's not from the New Kingdom or the Ptolemaic period, it's from Dynasty One, Dynasty Zero, Dynasty One. Um, uh, we, I just received the results about three or four days ago of the chemical analysis of residues from the brewery and uh, the next step is to do residue analysis from the beer jars. Mm -hmm. And our, our, our program, excavation program for next year is to go to all of the enclosures where we know or suspect the beer jar deposits should be, obtain samples, and uh, subject them to residue analysis to see if the formula matches what we now see at the brewery. That's great, thank you. I will be looking forward to the, <laughs> Me the too. research. Thank you. Uh, I just have two questions. One, um, do you think that possibly the earlier structures were destroyed to prevent reuse? Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, I suppose that could have been part of it, that, uh, that once the dead king was in his tomb and he had made the uh, transition, uh, all the ritual focus should be on the living king then. And his predecessor had gone. He had done his thing. We didn't need to be concerned about him anymore. Uh, that's actually a good idea that I hadn't thought about. Previously. Well, maybe also that you didn't want to interfere with what was done for him. Right. So that none of the ritual that was done for him could be diverted or taken over for anyone else. But I also wanted to ask, um, at what point was there start to be interior reuse of the Shuna? I think you said 700 years, there was nothing. So the, I wanted the, to be sure about that. Yeah, so the, 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 for 700 years after the reign of Kasekemwi, there was no activity whatsoever outside. This whole low desert landscape was empty except for the Shuna for seven centuries until the end of the first intermediate period. Then the interior was avoided. Nothing happened inside for another thousand years after that. And it wasn't until the beginning of the third intermediate period that we begin to see this animal cult uh, practiced inside about the same time that we begin to see other kinds of ritual activity taking place at the southeast corner and some other places. So uh, it, it's, it's as though the, the uh, protected sacred space to be avoided shrank at the beginning of the Middle Kingdom from the whole of the landscape just to the Shuna itself as its kind of anchor or so but then the, the, the interior uh, was avoided for even longer, another millennium. Mm -hmm. uh, and even then, uh, the intrusion was uh, sacred in character. It was religious in character. For, mm -hmm. It was a sacred animal necropolis at that point. But, but weren't there um, infant, maybe fetus burials in the walls? That was... Uh, part of this ritual activity that we see at the corner, the exterior corner here. They were uh, not inside. Not inside, okay. So there were, we, we that have started at what point? It's post-New Kingdom. Mm -hmm. 
So in the uh, third intermediate period. Do you think there was a reason why it happened in the third intermediate period? Can you have any idea? Well, I, I'm, I'm not uh, actually, uh, I dislike the idea of intermediate periods uh, in, in framing Egyptian history uh, uh, because I think that the uh, much of the social, economic, and political fabric uh, of ancient Egypt uh, was fairly stable throughout. And the, the intermediate periods, as we think of them, uh, are really uh, phenomena that really only are visible uh, from a high elite perspective, as with so many other aspects of uh, Egyptian culture. Uh, it may be that uh, state oversight of uh, regulation or control of the use of the monument was lessened, was relaxed uh, at the end of the New Kingdom. Uh, that might be uh, part of it, but uh, religious, religious ritual was changing also, and animal cults were, became eventually the predominant uh, ritual practice, the way uh, religious belief was expressed, um, uh, which was a very long-lasting uh, phenomenon then. So it may be uh, that control was relaxed at the end of the New Kingdom, uh, or it simply could be uh, you know, a gradual change in religious practice and emphasis that was so it doesn't necessarily mean that the sacred space of the interior was really being violated? No, I don't think it was being violated. I think that the, it, was, uh, uh, it was being, the, 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 the sacredness was being approached in a different way. It was being mm -hmm. reinterpreted. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they were building houses inside, okay, that's a violation of sacred space. Mm -hmm. uh, but the transformation into a sacred animal necropolis, uh, that's still uh, connecting with the divine. Mm -hmm. And that during those 1,700 years, there's no other evidence of activity within the interior that you've found? Yeah, okay. Ram said, well, <laughs> <laughs> make some difference about the interpretation of all this, too. Thank you very much right. for a my, wonderful lecture. My pleasure, thank you. We have one last question, maybe. Thank you very much for this long story of the site's sacredness. Um, as a non-Egyptologist, I'll ask a non-Egyptological question about the Coptic period. Mm. Um, if you could tell us more about this presence, uh, I assume that after that, the site was not used for example, during the Islamic period. Right. So can you tell us more about um, the, the sacredness of this space for during the Coptic period? And if you found any other evidence uh, than the inscriptions, that's one question. And the second question is a bit more debatable, uh, which is linked, of course, to a necessary conservation intervention, like you mentioned. But have you left any traces where people visiting the site would also get to know part of this long story through any remains uh, of the Coptic um, remains that you found there? Uh, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, we, where the presence of the Coptic spaces uh, did not threaten catastrophic losses to the walls, we excavated, documented, and left them, backfilled, so that they're covered. Um, we would hope, ultimately, to be able to integrate that one of those, anyway, into the visitor experience. Uh, it is an important part of the history of the monument, uh, and uh, I would love to be able to do that. Uh, I want to finish the main walls first, stop them from falling down, and then uh, turn to that. Um, uh, Secondly, the, 
the presence of this monastic community at the Shuna uh, uh, is just part of a much broader uh, transformation and reinterpretation of this sacred landscape. Uh, at roughly the same time as uh, the community took up residence here, um, a lot of uh, pharaonic tombs in the cemetery all around it were emptied out, remodeled into uh, oratories, and uh, living spaces were built around or on top of them. So uh, there was a, uh, a kind of wholesale reoccupation. There was the, 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 uh, the, the overriding, let's say, by early Christians on this ancient pagan landscape. They, at the Shuna, they burrowed into the fabric of the monument itself. In the cemetery, all around it, they emptied out dozens and dozens of, uh, of uh, vaulted tomb chambers and were living in them and praying in them. They were turning the, the tomb chambers into oratories with niches in the end, a typical uh, kind of uh, pattern. And uh, to the north, off this uh, photograph, um, uh, the, in the Ptolemaic period, there was a gigantic uh, hypogeum that was built uh, uh, to contain ibis burials. Uh, this was excavated by a team from Brown a few years ago. Um, and uh, we're now looking at what to do with this hypogeum in terms of visitors uh, uh, and uh, working with the local Christian community, which is still very strong there, uh, involving them in how to approach this. Some of the spaces have lovely uh, paintings of uh, biblical figures and biblical stories and early Christian martyrs, martyrs are represented and so it's amazing. Um, uh, so the, the, uh, the Shun is occupied, the tombs are reused, this Ptolemaic Ibis Hypogeum is uh, repurposed wholesale on a very large scale. Uh, and also, next door, there's a huge Ptolemaic mud brick enclosure of some kind, big enclosure wall. And inside that enclosure wall, as long as we have uh, relatively modern accounts from medieval times on, this enclosure has been home to a Christian community. There's a church there called the uh, Dersit Damiana, uh, or part of Dersit Damiana, uh, that the local community itself says goes back to, you know, the 11th century or something like this. Um, and, uh, so, but there's no question that a Christian presence has been inside this ancient Ptolemaic structure for many, many centuries. So that, I think, is also part and parcel of this wholesale reuse. And we know that uh, in other parts of Abydos, there was also very large scale early Christian activity. There's there are the remains of a big monastery near the Temple of Seti I that uh, the excavators think could be the monastery that was created at the site by uh, Abu Musa, one of the original uh, early Christian fathers who was known to come from Sohag to Abydos to deal with the last remnants of the pagan uh, presence there. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's a very large installation, much bigger than anything in North uh, Abydos. So I think it's a very deliberate um, Christianization of ancient Abydos that may may be a response to the, um, the strength of the pagan cults that were surviving there. It was the cult place of Osiris, you know, one of the most important religious figures in ancient Egyptian culture. Um, and, you know, that, that Bess oracle is still hanging on in early Christian times, and the Coptic fathers come to duke it out uh, and, and put him in his place. Um, 
And so it may have been a, uh, a deliberate policy of overriding the pagan ancient landscape to Christianize it uh, and, and be done with it, as it were. Thank you very much, and thank you again for this wonderful lecture and this uh, very stimulating discussion. And I hope we will uh, welcome you again uh, uh, very soon for another lecture and to, for an update of your discoveries and uh, uh, great work in uh, Abydos. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you soon. Thank you.